You know, it's our duty and responsibility. I think you know that by now if you're a regular listener. It's our duty and responsibility to do our best to instruct you in the things pertaining to the Christian life and to warn you of those things that would hinder your growth in grace and your uh, proper spiritual development. One of the things it seems that we are constantly reminding you about and warning you about is the damnable dangerous effect of these new and modern translations of the Bible. This is not a hobby horse that we ride. This is not uh, something that we constantly and continually harp on, as some have accused, falsely accused, I ought to say, because as you know, in in a year's worth of broadcasts, we may spend only four or five uh, programs dealing with this matter. But it cannot go unsaid, it cannot be left uh, uh, undiscussed, because this is the most most damnable device of the devil in this generation. If he can't keep you from reading the Bible, if he can't keep you from looking to the pages of the Holy Bible, he can certainly get you to look at a Bible that isn't the truth. And therefore his purposes are accomplished, even though he has not uh, kept you from uh, the book of God. As a matter of fact, his accomplishes are, uh, his purposes are accomplished in even greater measure and extent because so many are content and satisfied that they have indeed read the Bible or studied the scriptures. And so the fact that Satan has gotten them to study a Bible or a set of scriptures that are not uh, the true word of God uh, greatly serves uh, his purpose. Now on the program today, we want to begin a very brief series of studies on the new King James Version. The new King James Version. This is uh, called in England the Revised Authorized Version or the RAV called the NKJV here in the States. Uh, This book's published by Thomas Nelson Publishers of Nashville, Tennessee. They own the copyright to both these versions. It's refreshing to know to the preface to these versions, and by the way, we're indebted to uh, Brother D.K. Madden of the Pilgrim Brethren, interesting group, uh, for much of this research, and we thank him for his work and are glad to help him get it out. It's refreshing to know to the preface to these versions the statement that their New Testament has been based on the Greek textus receptus, or received text thus perpetuating the tradition begun by William Tyndale in 1525 and continued by the translators of the 1611 authorized version known as the King James Bible. Again, it's noted with pleasure if you look under the preface heading Complete Equivalence in Translation that the translators reject the system of dynamic equivalence. Now this is what's used by the Good News Bible and Living Bible and other uh, comic books like that Uh, The translators of the New King James used the principle of complete equivalence. This was a characteristic work of the 1611 KJV men, whose aim was to produce an accurate and complete translation of what was actually written in the Hebrew and Greek text. The modern translators' insistence upon dynamic equivalence often results in a very free paraphrase of the underlying text. The authorized version preface, entitled Translators to the Reader, which was printed in the original edition of the 1611 AV and was reproduced in subsequent editions over a period of many years, but is sadly seldom now to be seen, included under the heading The Praise of the Holy Scriptures the following statement. The original thereof being from heaven, not from earth. The author being God, not man. The inditer, the Holy Spirit, not the wit of the apostles or prophets, the penmen, such as were sanctified from the womb and endued with the principal portion of God's spirit, the matter, verity, piety, purity, uprightness, the form, God's word, God's testimony, God's oracles, the word of truth, the word of salvation, etc., the effects, light of understanding, stableness of persuasion, repentance from dead works, newness of life, holiness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Lastly, the end and reward of the study thereof fellowship of the saints, participation of the heavenly nature, fruition of an inheritance immortal, undefiled, and that shall never fade away, 
Happy is the man that delighteth in the scripture, and thrice happy that meditateth in it day and night. Now the vast majority of the modern versions make no mention of these vitally important truths. In view of this, it is very welcome to note that the divine authorship of Holy Scripture is acknowledged by the people who produced the New King James in their preface, where it is also stated that all the participating scholars signed a document of subscription to the plenary and verbal inspiration of the original autographs of the Bible. Now it's amazing that people can say they believe the original autographs were inerrant when they've never seen them. That's a great leap of faith. Having acknowledged the above commendable features, it is now sadly necessary to draw attention to some serious problems which the New King James poses for those who tremble at God's holy word. First of all, we need to look at the absence of certain distinctive pronouns. Continuing with the preface of the New King James with reference to the style, it is stated, and I quote, readers of the authorized version will immediately be struck by the absence of several pronouns. The, thou, and ye are replaced by the simple you while your and yours are substituted for thy and thine as applicable." End of quote. Now in the Hebrew and Greek texts of the Bible, the distinction is made between the singular and plural personal pronouns. And this always conveys some information. And frequently the full meaning of a passage of Scripture is obscured when a translator renders all the second person pronouns by you, your, or yours. For example, in the epistle to Philemon, we note in the first verse, Paul's address to Philemon, and in the second verse, is addressed to two others and a church. Then in verse 3, the Greek plural pronoun, humin, H-U-M-I-N, that is you, indicates that Paul's greeting of grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ is addressed to all of the above persons. This information is correctly conveyed to the reader by the English word you in the old KJV. Now the new King James also translates human by you, but it is now an ambiguous you and could be either singular or plural. Then, in verses 20 and 21, it is clear from the text that Paul is addressing Philemon only. And this information is correctly conveyed by the use of the English singular pronouns thee, thy, and thou in the Old King James Bible. But all of this is obscured by the substitution of you and your in the New King James. Though the correct meaning may still be apparent by the word brother in verse 20, nevertheless, when we come to verse 22, the New King James conveys the impression that Paul is still addressing Philemon only. Whereas the original language carries plural pronouns here, human and human, correctly translated your and you in the old King James, this indicates that Paul is here addressing all the brethren to whom he wrote. The new King James causes further confusion in verses 23 and 25. Now, from just this one little passage, it's obvious that the translators of the New King James Version have withheld from their readers important information which is present in the Greek text and is quite capable of being expressed in the English language. Again, the fact of our Lord's concern for the apostles and his particular prayer for Peter because he was in the greatest danger is obscured by the New King James rendering of the pronouns in Luke 22, 31, and 32. Here Jesus said Satan's desired the uh, disciples. And Jesus says in verse 31, The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. That's plural. That's all the disciples. That he may sift you as wheat. That's all of them. But I have prayed for thee, Peter singular, that thy, Peter singular, faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now you can only get that 
in the King James Bible. Now, I'm aware that many people favor the elimination of the distinctive singular personal pronouns on the ground that they are archaic relics of Elizabethan Jacobian English. And I want to point out to you the fact that this claim is not entirely true. In fact, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, such words as thee, thou, and thine were beginning in common speech to re be replaced by you and your. Now, if you don't believe this, all you got to do is reference the works of William Shakespeare. For example, in Macbeth, Act 3, Scene 4, and at the end of this scene, Lady Macbeth says to her husband, Did you send for him, sir? Again in King Henry IV, Act 2, Scene 1. I have at a glance counted you twelve times and your four times. Again in uh, Henry the, the Fourth or Sixth, Henry the Sixth, Act 2, Scene 1. You read less than half this scene, and you'll encounter you three times and your twice. Now, in all the instances referred to above, the context clearly indicates that a single person is being addressed. So, the fact is that the English usage of the old King James Bible is biblical rather than Elizabethan. It is biblical for the very reason that the Hebrew and Greek texts of the Holy Scripture do indeed differentiate between singular and plural personal pronouns in all instances. Very sadly, the new King James has completely eliminated this distinction, with a result an objective loss of accuracy and a subjective loss of a distinctive reverence for God. The elimination of these particular personal pronouns from almost all of the modern versions has been accompanied by a type of familiarity with God which ignores the fact that our God is a consuming fire and that without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 29 and 14. We do well to remember and heed the fact that Scripture declares in Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The use of the distinctive personal pronouns, thee, thou, thy, thine, in address to God in prayer, rather than our present common everyday usage, you, your, yours, does or should, help to remind us that we are addressing no earthly monarch, but they, that we are in the supreme presence of the Almighty Creator and Sustainer of all things, the Ruler and Judge of all who could not even be approached by his sinful creatures if it were not for the fact that in his gracious, loving mercy he has, at infinite cost, provided a mediator in the person of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. By him, Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But, let it be a holy boldness not an irreverent familiarity. Having regard to the solemn warning given in Revelation 22.19, no doubt the translators would not wish to take away from the Word of God, but it must be acknowledged that their treatment of the pronouns has the effect of diminishing the accuracy and clarity of the translation, and to this extent is a subtraction from the full content of divinely given information. Now later on in our study we'll uh, make reference to some of the problems caused by the absence of certain distinctive singular personal pronouns, but at this time let's move on to our next point, and that is the capitalization of pronouns relating to God. Now, the New King James preface, still under the heading, the style, continues, quote, However, reverence for God in the present work is preserved by capitalizing pronouns, including you, your, and yours, which refer to him. The reader needs to be aware, as he reads these Bibles, that the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts of the Bible do not provide this distinction. Thus the translator who would employ this device must of necessity become an interpreter. And unless he is infallible, which he is not, there is a very real probability that he will be mistaken in at least some passages. And this probability becomes almost a certainty if he holds unorthodox views of Scripture. 
Note, a careful distinction must be made between what professes to be a translation of Scripture and that which purports to be a commentary on Scripture. In the case of the latter, the thoughtful reader knows that the commentator's interpretation, as distinct from the Scripture itself, is not inspired, and he must himself judge in the light of other parts of Scripture as to whether it is a sound interpretation, or at least hold an open mind on the matter if he is not competent to judge. However, when he reads what professes to be merely a translation of Scripture, he can be expected to believe that what he reads is a faithful rendering of the Hebrew and Greek text from which the translation was made. Doubtless, Uzzah's intentions were good. When he put forth his hand to the ark of God in 2 Samuel 6, but in actual fact he was disobeying a distinct command of God from Numbers chapter 4, and he suffered the threatened consequences he was killed. Now I expect that likewise the translators of the New King James thought that they were doing good when they introduced their selective capitalizations of the initial letter of certain personal pronouns with the expressed intention of showing reverence for God. But has God required this at their hand? No, he hasn't. They've added to his word, violating the commands of Deuteronomy 4.2, Proverbs 30 and verse 6, and Revelation 22.18, and nothing but evil can come of it. Continuing with the preface of the New King James, and I quote again, Additionally, capitalization of these pronouns benefits the reader by clearly distinguishing divine and human persons referred to in a passage. Now, in adopting the use of capital letters for this purpose, the translators burden themselves with the necessity of distinguishing in every passage between the divine and human persons to whom reference is made. Admittedly, they do confess that on two occasions their wisdom failed them. If you'll see the text and footnote at 2 Thessalonians 2.7 and Psalm 25.12, they had to admit they didn't know what to do with the passage. But as far as I can find, these are the only places in the whole New King James where they have indicated any doubt about their judgment. This would seem to imply that they considered their verdict to be beyond doubt in every other case. In consequence of this, every passage of Scripture, apart from 2 Thessalonians 2.7 and Psalm 25.12, has now been given in the New King James a final and unalterable designation of either divine or human reference. In view of the terrible mutilation of the majority of the precious Old Testament references to the Lord Jesus Christ in the New American Standard uh, Bible, uh, through their use of this very same device, we need to take a look at the New King James. Now, personal pronouns are capitalized in the following places where prophetic reference is made to Jesus Christ. Genesis 3.15, Genesis 16.7-13, 18.10, 31.11-13, Genesis 32.24-29, and 49.10. Also in Exodus 23, verses 20-22, and Numbers 24.17, Deuteronomy 18.15-19, and Joshua 5.13-14. See also Psalms 2, 22, 45, 72, and 110, Isaiah 11, 1 to 5, 42, 1 to 4, chapter 6, chapter 53, and chapter 61, verse 1. Also in Zechariah 6, 12 to 13, 9, 9, and 12, 10. Now I think if you check these references, all soundly orthodox evangelical Christians would agree that every one of the above passages refer to him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. However, there are also passages recognized by most sound Bible-believing Christians as referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, which have been given a purely human designation by the translators of the New King James. A few examples, Psalm 69. Psalm 89, 27, Proverbs 8, Proverbs 23, 26, Ezekiel 34, 23, 
Zechariah 9.17 and Acts 13.47. Now, for example, in the case of Psalm 89.27, the, the King James Bible reads, Also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Now there's no doubt this verse has primary reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. As far back as Matthew Henry, John Gill, David Dixon, and Matthew Poole, commentators understood this to be a reference to Jesus Christ. The New King James renders this verse, also I will make him, no capitalization, my capitalization, and then no other capitalization throughout the verse. So the my is written in a capital M, thus according to the system of the New King James, indicating deity for the speaker, God the Father. But when God the Father speaks of, the, of his firstborn being the highest of the kings of the earth, this firstborn king is not capitalized. And so according to the, the entirely unscriptural innovation of the New King James, they have precluded the possibility of this firstborn king being the Lord Jesus Christ. Now who they think it might be is, is beyond me, but uh, that's, that's their rendering. Further note, the New King James has the highest of the kings of the earth. Not so. Not so. The King James Bible reads higher than the kings of the earth. Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ is not highest among equals. He is above all. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, Revelation 19.16. So the New King James rendering is not only in error because of the capitalization uh, problem, but it's an error because of the perverse rendering of the verse. Again, Proverbs 23, verse 26. The King James Holy Bible reads, My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Now concerning the scripture, the learned 18th century Baptist commentator John Gill wrote, These are not the words of Solomon to his son, for a greater than Solomon is here. Besides the claim and possession of a heart do not belong to a creature, but to God. For they are the words of wisdom, or Christ, to every one of his sons, the children of the Father, or the children the Father has given to him. Matthew Henry has a somewhat similar comment. Now it's noted that the New King James does not make distinctive capitalizations of the initial letter of me and my in this verse. Thus, the translators of this version have arbitrarily excluded God from this verse of Scripture. In the case of Zechariah 9.17, the first half of this verse in the Old King James Bible reads, For how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. All the following. Calvin, Jameson, Frost, and Brown, Poole, Gill, Matthew, Henry. They all saw this as being a reference to God. In fact, Henry and Gill apply it specifically to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And in this, we have no doubt they are correct. And so you can't help but be saddened, if not surprised, that the New King James translators render this passage as follows, For how great is their goodness, and how great is their beauty, now, who in the world this plurality of persons is to which the New King James is referring is anybody's guess. But they've certainly written God right out of the passage. Now, I'm aware that some men are called good in Scripture. Joseph of Arimathea, Luke 23.50, Barnabas, Acts 11.24, but there are also references to good men in general in Psalms and Proverbs. But... Any mere man's goodness is only comparatively so. Jesus declared there's none good but one, and that is God. So in light of these facts, I believe this passage in Zechariah, where stress is laid on the greatness and goodness of the one to whom reference is made, this can rightly be applied only to our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And further, it's interesting to observe that the New King James has a footnote concerning the word there at Zechariah 9.17, which reads, literally his. Well, if they knew that, why didn't they put his in the text? Was it because they were so determined at all costs to exclude God from this verse? Because even the word his in their footnote was not written with a capital H. Well, these are the kind of things you run into. I said, that Brother James, he's hard-nosed. That Brother James, he's so hypercritical. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We're simply doing our very best. We're doing our very best to keep you from falling into the snare of the devil knowing that the way he beguiled Eve was by casting doubt upon, altering, and then rejecting the text of what God actually said. 